Hi, and thanks for tuning into my talk on composing Unix with effect handlers, um, a case study in what I like to call effect handler oriented programming. And um, the objective of this talk is really to um, demonstrate or convince you that effect handlers are worthwhile programming abstraction. And the way I intend to do that is by way of an example, I'll take Richie and Thompson's Unix, opera Unix operating system and show you how you can build that using effect handlers. In particular, I'm going to show how you can actually think about Unix in terms of uh, standard uh, effects such as exceptions, dynamic binding, uh, non-determinism, uh, and state. In this particular talk, we will not get for uh, the, the time sharing uh, non-determinism. Um, moreover, I'm going to add a few self-imposed constraints, constraints, and that's actually just to drive home the point uh, that effect handlers are really powerful and flexible mechanism. Um, so the, the first thing I'm going to impose is that everything I do in this talk has to be definable in the language. I'm not going to use any primitive uh, effects such as printing to a console and etc. The second one is that any interface I define in this talk, uh, I can never change. I have to, I sort of have to live with my legacy code. Let's dive right in some, with some code here. We'll begin by implementing some basic IO, or maybe you can't call this IO because we're only going to do the O part, the output, we're only going to handle writes here but it'll, it'll get the point across. Uh, and just before I get uh, too deep into it, I should mention that the language that I'm using here is the program language Lynx. Now, the, the basic tenant of programming with effect handlers is that the doing is separate from the being, or in other words, that the syntax is separate from the semantics. And what that concretely means, I'll illustrate here um, by implementing the um, echo uh, uh, utility, which takes a string and prints that to stand that out. Uh, I'll implement it using uh, an effectful operation called write. So we'll, we'll see here how to do a write and what it means to be a write. Um, so we have echo here, which is a function that takes a string um, and it ultimately returns a unit. In doing so, it may perform the effects in this signature. In this particular effect signature, there's one operation present and that's write which is parameterized by the file script that we wish to write to uh, and the string contents we will write to that file script. The operation itself returns unit. So now we can implement echo uh, by uh, doing or performing the, the, the write operation here. So in links, you do it this way. You type do write. That's the invocation form for, for operations. Uh, and then we need to give it some payload. We have no one. File descriptor, standard out, uh, and then we can supply the string contents that we've been given as input. This is an abstract computation. Uh, if you try to run echo now, um, the the program will stop. There, there's no there's no semantics associated with write yet, so we need to we need to give that. And and the semantics of an operation is conferred by its handler. So let's implement the handler down here that I call basic IO. So it takes one of these computations that can do writes. Uh, the computation can return anything. Uh, then ultimately the handler is going to return whatever that computation returned along with the current state of the file. So let's look at the definition of how we can implement this. Given the computation as input, in links the way you handle a computation is you wrap it in a handle, you apply the computation. Now there are two things to consider. We need to consider the return value of m uh, and um, any invocations of write within m. Let's begin with the return value. So if you get an answer back, then what we need to return on the right-hand side here is the answer along with the file, uh, the current set of the file. At this point, we don't have any file, so we need, we need to build it up first. So what we can do to satisfy the type checker is to give it the empty string. So the file is empty at this point. Then let's consider what happens when a write occurs. We can ignore the... Um, the file descriptor for now, since there's only one, uh, we get the contents, to write, and in addition, we also get access to uh, the continuation of write within uh, M. And it's worth to remark here that the type of resume is uh, something is a function that takes a unit and then returns uh, uh, whatever the handle returns, namely a, a pair consisting of the return value uh, and a, a file. So you, you'll, you'll note here that this unit here matches exactly the expectation of write, which is supposed to return a, a unit. So the input to resume is going to be the output of the operation write within M. Um, 
um, the reason resume returns um, this pair here is because it's what's known in literature as a deep handler. That means the resumption or the continuation resume here uh, implicitly wraps the handler around it uh, when I invoke it. Um, so you can so we can so what we can do now is we can actually invoke resume and then we'll get the answer plus the current state uh, of the file back. So let's try to do that. So if we uh, get the answer plus file. Uh, resume like this then what we need to do is we need to return that answer along with the next state or the updated state of the file so we can build the file up like this with string concatenation so we we sort of append um, the, the, the given string onto the file so basically what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm using the implicit state given by the by the runtime to me the, namely the call stack to manage the state of the file um, you can see this is sort of a silly buffered writing uh, or something like that. Um, right, so I have an example to illustrate this in action here, the example zero. Uh, in this example, I install the basic IO handler and then the computation that I run under it is echo hello, echo world. Um, and now if you try to load this up in a links prompt, I have right here, load the file. Um, I do example zero and what we see here is we get the return value is unit uh, from the computation and then the state of the file is the two echoes concatenated, so hello world. Right, so that's rather basic. Another sort of basic thing is um, premature process termination, which we can uh, model using exceptions. So in Unix you'll have this exit system call, which takes a, um, an exit code and then terminates the process with that exit code. Um, so the way we can model this is as a function that performs an exit operation uh, that's parameterized by the exit code, and then it will return something of the empty type. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, impossible, so that means the operation will never return, so we can think of it intuitively as an exception. Uh, the exit function itself will return something of polymorphic type, which is completely safe because exit will never return. Uh, the way you do that uh, concretely in links is you invoke the exit operation in an uh, empty um, a pattern matching expression. So switch here is your pattern matching uh, construct in links. So your camel programmer is, you know, this is your match with or Haskell, your case of. Now we then need to uh, say what it means to perform an exit. So we have status here, uh, another handler that uh, takes one of these exit uh, invoking uh, computations and then ultimately returns an integer. Uh, so indicating whether well, or not it's it terminated with success the given computation. Um, right, so we give the computation, we do as before, we handle it by, invoke it, uh, by applying it. If it returns successfully, we just uh, um, return the, the integer zero to indicate success like in Unix. Um, if uh, exit occurs, uh, then we get access to the to the payload, the, the exit code. Um, we also oh, we also get access to the uh, resumption or the continuation, which um, in this instance is completely um, useless uh, because it expects as input something of the empty type. So we can actually never invoke this one, right? So we can we can light this all together. Um, Right, so what we can basically do here is we can just return the exit code. So this has the effect of short circuiting uh, the remainder of the computation within M. Um, so uh, let's see here, I have an example to illustrate this. Example one, so what we do here is we install first the basic IO handler, underneath that the status handler, and then the computation that we run uh, is echo, um, the dead, uh, string, uh, sorry, ex exit with one, and then we echo the string code. The point here is that we should never see code being written to the to the file. Um, uh, and indeed here, if we type example one, we see here we get uh, the process terminated with exit code one and the current state of the file is the string dead. So indeed we never see code. Right, moving on to something maybe a slightly more interesting. Um, in an operating system, it's, you, you, you typically have multi-user support, at least you have that in, in Unix, um, and each user has their own environment, uh, and each environment provides some user-specific variables. 
Um, so we can model this uh, using dynamic binding. And in my particular system here, I'm going to assume there are three users, uh, Alice, Bob, and Root. And uh, I'm going to assume there's only one uh, envi environment variable, a variable, and that's the user environment var variable, which contains a, um, a string representation of the inquiring user. Um, so what I'm basically going to show here is how we can implement the, uh, the reader monad or environment monad uh, using effect handlers. So we will have, uh, we'll implement the uh, utility who am I? And uh, what it's going to do is simply going to invoke an operation called ask, which ask for the, um, for the, for, for the string representation of the, of the current user. Uh, and the implementation here is incredibly simple. It's just going to invoke the operation and that's all. So it's up to the ambient environment to now give a meaning uh, to this ask operation. And let's look at how we can implement the environment. So here is the signature of the environment. It's parameterized by a, um, by a user, that is the, the current user running. Um, and um, it takes a second parameter uh, computation that can perform these ask operations. Uh, the way we then implement um, the, the, the ask or interpret ask is that um, whenever ask occurs within M, we uh, get access to the continuation, and then we can simply just switch a pattern match on the uh, the user, the, the, the input that's writing to us, the user that we're running under, uh, and then we return the string representation of that user by invoking the presumption with that string. So it's all quite simple, actually. Uh, and I have an example here to illustrate it just uh, briefly. Um, so we, we install the environment handler, uh, run with root uh, as the user, and then we invoke the who am I uh, utility. And you will see here example two, if everything works, it should um, return st the string root and indeed it does. Right, so that gives us a separate environment, uh, but we still have no way of sort of switching between the users and you can do that in the multi-user uh, system usually as, uh, as Unix. Um, and the way you do that in Unix is you use a substitute uh, user uh, system call or SU. And uh, we can model that using an, uh, an operation that I call SU here. And it's parameterized by um, by the user that we want to uh, impersonate. Um, so the implementation of issue here is, is is of the function issue is simple. We just invoke the operation uh, with the with the payload user. Then here's the handler for it, which I call session manager. So just as before, it's parameterized by by a, by a user. Um, however, this is not. The idea here is that this is the initial user of the system, so the, the one that we start as, uh, and not necessarily the, 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 the user running the current computation. Um, then it will take a computation that can now perform two operations, the ask operation and the substitute user uh, operation. And um, the way we implement it is that we first install the initial environment which runs uh, the, the initial environment for the for the initial user, um, and then under that environment uh, we run a computation that handles uh, SU operations. So that's what you see defined here, and in particular this case here handles the SU, SU operation. So the SU gives us access to the user user prime, which is the user we want to impersonate, uh, and the continuation of that operation. Uh, and the way we uh, interpret this operation is as follows. We install another instance of the environment handler, this bit here. However, the, the crucial difference here is that it is parameterized by user prime and not the initial user we're given up here. And then the, con uh, the computation that we run under there is the continuation, uh, resume here applied to unit. Um, so this has the effect of overloading or shattering um, any residual uh, invocations of ask within resume. So that means uh, an invocation of ask inside resume will now get the string representation of user prime rather than user. Right, so I have an example to show this in action. Example three, so we installed basic IO handler. Then we installed the session manager handler running as the initial uh, user root. Under there, we install the status handler. And then the computation we do is we first SU as Alice, then we uh, echo who am I, uh, followed by echo space. And then we do the same for Bob and similar for root. And 
let's see here what happens. So now we have one um, one process has finished and the finish we execute zero. And then here we get the contents of the of the file. Uh, and we see here it has Alice, Bob and Root exactly in the order here that we, we uh, invoked them. Uh, so we have seen now we can switch, we have multiple users and we can switch between them. One thing that's still missing is a multitasking facility or the ability to, to, to run multiple things at once. Um, and we can use non-determinism to implement uh, multitasking, a form of multitasking. And particularly in, in, in Unix, the primitive for doing multitasking is fork, which has which duplicates its calling your process. Um, it typically returns an integer that uh, indicates the uh, process identifier for, for the child uh, process. Um, here I'll make a simplification and just have fork return a boolean. Uh, so we'll take true to mean that it's the parent branch is returning to and false if it's returning to the child. So we can implement fork simply as just an operation that is to fork that returns this boolean. Then the implementation of fork or the interpretation of fork is um, we can give that, that in terms of the standard non-determinism handler. Or if you're familiar with monads, the standard the sort of um, non-determinism monad. So it'll take one of these fork invoking uh, computations and then it will return a list of answers because fork will cause this computation to duplicate itself. So there'll be multiple answers potentially. Um, so the way we implement this is pretty straightforward. In the case that it returns, we lift that answer into the singleton list. In case fork uh, is invoked, then we grab the continuation and then we invoke this continuation twice. First with true to sort of explore or run the parent computation and then subsequently with false to run the child computation. And then we concatenate those results together to, to form the final list. So we can have some, some computations here. Uh, so I have a computation called Richie, which uh, echoes a quote from, from Dennis Richie. Uh, and I have a computation Hamlet that they quote some of, of, of Hamlet. Now we can plug this together and we can see it all in action. So example four here, we installed the basic IO handler. Then under there, we installed the non-determinism handler. Under that, we installed the session manager handler and then the status handler. Then the computation immediately forks and in the parent branch, it uh, impersonates uh, Alice and then she will perform the uh, write the Richie code. The child branch will um, issue as Bob and then uh, perform the um, Hamlet code. So let's see what happens here. Right, so now we have two processes that finished both with execute uh, zero and then uh, the state of the file here is now the two quote, the concatenation of the two quotes. Um, so Unix is a ba basically a simple operating system, blah, blah, blah. Um, so as you can see, there's no interleaving a computation or maybe we got incredibly lucky and uh, all the writes just happen to be in order, but I can guarantee that there is no interleaving a computation here. Everything still happens entirely uh, sequentially. So one way to sort of get time sharing or give everybody uh, an ability to run is to have some way of interrupting processes. And we can do that by introducing another operation called interrupt, uh, which simply returns a unit. And the idea here is that when interrupt occurs, then we're gonna, going to transfer control from one process to another process. And uh, in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to verify uh, the processes here. Um, and uh, that two states a process can be in, which is captured by this P state uh, type here. Um, either a process can be done with some return value, or some result, or it can be in a post state uh, where we have a func here that can perform some effects E, and then it will return another instance of, uh, of this P state data structure with the same result type and the same effects E. So a handler for this, which is called verify process here, will take uh, computations that can perform interrupts uh, and some other stuff. So there's some explicit effect polymorphism here. I will the, uh, omit the details. Um, and then it creates one of these P states with the return type and the additional effects that the, that the uh, computation may perform. Um, 
then the implementation here is rather straightforward. So in case it returns, uh, we just tack the return value with done. In case uh, interrupt happens, we grab the continuation and uh, then we wrap that in uh, or tack it with a post tag. Um, and then uh, I explicitly abstract the word here because uh, the resumption has to apply to unit and the definition up here expects a func, an honorary function. So people who are familiar with this will recognize this as the resumption monad, and that's basically all that's going on here, but in direct style. Um, then uh, using this p state, we now have a, a data structure that we can manipulate. We can write a little scheduler. Um, so we write a scheduler here that uh, operates or lists of uh, these processes or the, the states rather. Um, so they will return some A, but in doing so, they might uh, fork, meaning they might uh, uh, create additional processes. Ultimately, we just return uh, all the answers. So there's this list of processes, and the way you then go about and do this is you, you do some explicit state passing uh, recursive function here uh, that keeps track of the running processes and those that are done. And the one case that I want to draw attention to is the post case. It says here, if the head of the process list is a post uh, computation or a process, then what we do is we recursively uh, perform schedule on the tail of the um, process list, but we concatenate that with non-dead applied to this uh, continuation we got. Uh, and remember, non-dead is the thing that's going to handle uh, any invocations of fork that might appear, and it itself returns a list of, of answers. With this, we can then implement timeshare, which handles both fork and interrupt. It returns a list of answers. Um, oh, before I have an example, we still need to uh, talk about how we actually uh, inject interrupts because right now we, we have interrupts, but we have no way of sort of having a peer in code. Um, one idea is to use sort of an external source uh, to in inject interrupts. That's what uh, Daniel Arman and Mattia Pretna, they have this very nice work on uh, asynchronous effects. Um, however, this depends on having uh, something outside the language. There's some ambient environment that are going to in, in inject these interrupts and this is going to violate uh, one of my constraints so I cannot use this the, this will not be definable in the language second idea is to actually bundle interrupts with all operations so we could sort of before we perform a write we could perform this um, interrupt so concretely we could we call the echo we could do a sort of an echo prime here uh, again takes a string and then it will perform an interrupt and then afterwards it will do the write uh, so concretely in the definition, you do interrupt followed by do write uh, at the file script and with string contents. This will work fine and it works. Um, however, it violates the second constraint, namely that it modifies the interface of the function. Now I had to change the type of echo. I had to introduce this interrupt. And in fact, I'll have to introduce it everywhere where I use operations because any operation I want to actually be able to interrupt or, or yield from uh, will now need to mention this. Uh, so I can't use this either. The third idea is to use another handler to overload the interpretation of operations. So here I have a handler called interrupt write, uh, and it takes uh, a computation that can write. And then what it does is that the handler itself will perform the interrupt uh, and the write, it will sort of replay the write uh, operation. And you'll see here concretely in the code, if you look at the write case, it uh, performs the interrupt here and once the interrupt uh, returns, then we invoke the resumption with whatever interpretation we got from performing the write. Um, so, so this write here will not be handled by interrupt write because we we now outside of that context. So something further up the context will have to handle it, namely basic I/O, uh, as I'll show you here, which is my final example, uh, the time sharing example here, example five. So what we do is we first install the basic I/O handler. Under that, we install the time sharing handler. Under that, we install the interrupt uh, write handler. Um, and then under that, we install the session manager. Under that, we install the status handler. And then the computation is as before. We see here, if you run example five, uh, we get the following here. Again, two processes ran to completion, both with Xcode zero. And then we get this state of the file is, Unix is basically to be or not to be a simple operating system. That is the question. But whether to snowplant the mind to suffer, you have to be a genius to understand the simplicity. So as we can see here, the different echoes has been uh, interleaved. And as a result, we have some new poetry. And I'll, I'll leave you to be the judge of the quality of this poetry. Right. 
so that's the final thing I wanted to show now here. I, I hope this was enough to convince you at least, or give you a taste of the power of, of effect handlers, and uh, also to, to convince you that you can actually use this to retrofit legacy code with new functionality by just installing a new handler, uh, oftentimes. I hope also to convince you that uh, operating system can be explained in terms of handlers and we can sort of see uh, handlers as small composable operating systems. 